Let's begin straight away with our conversation. Funke Adekoya SEN has over 45 years experience in litigation and arbitration and is widely recognized and respected locally and internationally. At various times, she's been adjudged the most outstanding female legal practitioner in Nigeria and has been recognized by Who's Who Legal many times over as a global and national leader in arbitration and litigation. In the course of that journey, she faced gender discrimination and learned to deal with it. In this interview, she shares with Law Weekly why she chose to study law and how she's chosen to challenge. It just interested me, the relationship between people, the, the relationship between freedoms and the constraints that a society imposes on individuals to ensure that the society runs smoothly. So where does my freedom stop? Um, and those are the things that law and regulation are supposed to make smooth and clear. So if you have good laws, the society runs smoothly. So I think for me, that was my interest in law, more out of my interest in how a society works and can run smoothly. Possibly the first time I faced discrimination was when I was doing my youth service and I was posted to the north and I had to represent a client and the client said, yeah, I'm looking for the lawyer. I'm like, yeah, I'm the lawyer assigned to your case. As a youth cop. As a youth copper. And the client was like, nah, that's not happening. I want a lawyer. Thankfully, my, my boss, later Elijah Abdullah Ibrahim, was very open. And he took it as a personal affront that he had assigned someone to handle this man's case. And this man was rejecting his assignment only on the basis that I was a woman. And he took it from the point of view of, you don't trust my judgment. She can do it. If you don't want her to do it, take your file away. So that helped to bolster my confidence. But throughout my service here, I encountered that type of discrimination. Women were not expected to be in court, were not expected to sit at meetings where men were generally in the majority. And I think that was my first opening to discrimination. So you faced discrimination as a youth corps member, as a single person. I don't imagine that that changed when you got married. And how did you deal with it? it? It didn't stop. In fact, what I discovered when I got married, I, was, I started married life in Kaduna, no traffic, everything was easy. And as I said, I had a very supportive boss. So I used to take my son to the office in his little basket and he'd sit in the corner and I'd do my work. And sometimes it would be Elijah Ibrahim who would say, go home, time to go home. It was actually when I came to Lagos that I really ex uh, recognized that there is gender discrimination in the legal profession. Because then, first of all, even to get a job in Lagos, that was the first time I, this question of, oh, you're married, you're gonna have to be taking care of children. How would you cope? How would you cope? And these were from firms that I had known even before I had finished in the university. New younger lawyers who were starting up their own practices and were very unwilling to, you know. And somebody actually said, you know, we'd really love to have you. But we had a woman um, last year and she just upped and left. Meaning what? Women are not reliable. I'm like, okay. So, and it just continued from there. And then this crazy belief that we've had in the legal profession for the 45 years that I have been a lawyer, that there are no ladies at the bar. It doesn't help women in the profession. I mean, in Kenya, the judges, female judges are lady justice. They acknowledge their gender. So those, there is discrimination in the legal profession. And we women lawyers are not doing as much as we should be doing. What should we be doing? We should, first of all, we should all, at every opportunity, object to this, there are no ladies at the bar. It doesn't help our case. It's not a question of we're all equal. 
because we know we are not all equal. Look at the profession. How many women-owned law firms are there? How many female partners are there in established law firms? How many female legal practitioners have really risen to the top? How many female legal practitioners are SANs when you compare with the number of male legal practitioners? So it's not a question of we are all equal. So we should start from that. And then we should be able to push the initiatives that will enable us to perform at our best. In ALEX, we have a crash for our female lawyers and our female staff. Why? Because after probably eight or nine years, I was able to persuade my partners that it doesn't make economic sense to train women lawyers, get them to up their game, and then they get married, and they can't perform at the level you have trained them to perform because they're at work and their minds are on their three or four month old babies that they have left at home. So when you look at it just from the economic angle, and, I, and maybe that's the angle that made the case, but now we have young mothers who bring their children into the crash. They're sitting at their desks, they're doing their work, their mind is at rest. Their mind is at rest and they can focus because on the when they want to breastfeed, they just walk around the corner, walk into the crash, breastfeed, child is there with the nanny, they come back, they can focus. When it's time for them to go home, they pick up their babies, they go home. These are the things that we as women lawyers and as women generally need to push for. The economic argument why women should be allowed to perform at the level that God has enabled them to. I want to come back to something that you said about the stigma, the stereotypes that women face. You know, apart from the legal profession, it also happens in the larger society. Why do you think that it's difficult to attain equal rights and opportunities for women? I've even heard some people say that gender equality is not possible. It is a very slow process, but it will happen. It will happen, and, and it may even happen faster than we think. And the reason is simple, economics. 50, 60 years ago, a man wanted to marry a wife who would take care of him and take care of the home and take care of the children. And it was his job to be the breadwinner. And women were socialized in that same mindset. I'm not supposed to work. I'm so, my work is homework keep the house clean, neat and tidy, support, support my husband, support my children. Economics have changed. A man now, very few men can be a sole breadwinner. So we've moved from a stage where men who are breadwinners and their wives helped and they didn't acknowledge it, they didn't notice that the curtains have changed, or that there's a new freezer in the kitchen. And even when they acknowledge, oh, that's nice. Oh, you, you, you know, you bought a freezer. Uh, you know, it's kitchen. It's your, it's your area. It's your territory. Now you have younger couples who sit down and budget together. I pay the rent. You pay the school fees. I buy the food. You buy the petrol. I pay for the gas. You pay for the electricity. Now it's a question of we're building a family together. We're building a home together. So things are changing much faster because of that. And because the economics are changing, the men, especially the younger generation, have come to realize that, look, if I need her financial input for us as a family to live the lifestyle I'd like us to live, then I must assist to ensure that she can earn that income. True. And so you find more young fathers going to teachers' days, open days in school. PTA. PTA meetings yeah. to be sure their children are getting the best education. It used to be the woman would go to work. From work, she run to PTA meeting. She come back. From there, she runs to the market. From there, now you see men in the supermarkets. They themselves are picking up things on the home. So things are changing. Now, as one of the country's leading lawyers, I imagine that you feel scandalized by the recent reports on the appointment of judges. 
we heard that some of them couldn't answer basic legal questions. Your father was on the bench, and I don't imagine that things have always been this way. Now, there are a lot of theories as to why things have gone south, but what, in your opinion, should the NBA be doing, especially when you consider the long-term impact of this on the legal profession? Well, I think the NBA is off to a good start, even just by speaking out and saying, hey, what is it I'm seeing? And I commend our NBA president for that because this is not the first time. I am chairman of the Justice Reform Project. Sometime last year, there was a similar appointment. Yes, and the, the JRP spoke And the JRP out. not only spoke out, we instituted a legal action to say these people do not comply with the same guidelines that you put in place. The matter was thrown out on the basis that we have no locus. We are currently in the Court of Appeal. So the, the legal profession has to speak out. You are right, it wasn't this bad. It wasn't like this. I think the reason why it has become an issue of jobs for the boys is a question again of the economics. There's no work. So they will learn on the job. They will learn on the job. There's no work, so people are bringing their protégés. It's just a job. Whether they have the skills or not, they're bringing their protégés to, to the high court to start with. It's a job. Once I can get you there, you are government picking. They'll pay your salary, they give you accommodation, and you just mark time. Then you get to a point where you're eligible to go to the court of appeal. And then you either lobby or you have a godfather who then puts your name forward as well to go to the court of appeal. So we're just, I think personally, in the profession today, we are in a race to the bottom. So you'd be expecting the NBA to challenge by filing a suit? Yes, yes. At least they won't say they don't have locus. Finally, let's talk about your recent appointment as President International Lawyers for Africa. Congratulations on that appointment. Thank you very much. Now, I read on social media that as president of ILFA, you would seek to reinforce the core connections at the heart of ILFA by also speaking to the next generation of young lawyers. Now, tell us a little about the work that ILFA does and how you hope to achieve um, these moves with the young lawyers. ILFA, International um, Lawyers for Africa, is a United Kingdom charity established by some English lawyers who were seeking to do good by way of providing opportunities for African lawyers to come and spend time in English law firms and gain from the experiences that English law firms had in special areas basically in commercial and corporate law practice areas. So it's a charity. And the flagship program is this secondment program, where by virtue of national committees set up in African countries, people apply to go on this secondment program. The national committees select the best and the brightest. And then they are sent to the UK and spend a period of time they go to Oxford, they take lectures in Oxford, they take lectures in Cambridge. And then they spend this period of time in various offices of these UK law firms where they're exposed to cutting edge legal practice. So it's some sort of a skills transfer. Now, the benefit for the UK law firms is that as they also represent clients who have business in African countries, they want to be sure that their clients have the best legal expertise available to them. So they look at it from that perspective. From the African perspective, it gives us as African lawyers an opportunity to see how law is practiced in other countries and the priorities that they give to certain things. Mm -hmm.